Hey kids, this is Ivan. How you doing? Well, since 1974, leveling up has been part of the Dungeons & Dragons experience. You know, when I get to this level, I will have this. You know, I can cast Fireball. Um, however, uh, for a lot of us, you know, over time, um, the unintended experience or effect of this leveling up process has been that very often it takes um, our focus away from the experience as our character takes it away from the fiction, what are we doing, and starts to put a lot of our uh, focus on this need to get better, get experience so we can level up, so we can become more powerful, so we can do the thing, you know, so to speak, you know, ad infinitum. And there's, there's a joke about, you know, D&D being a game where you go out and you kill things to gain experience so you can get better at killing things. And um, there are a lot of other games out there that have completely abandoned this leveling uh, mechanic or system and instead use some kind of skill-based uh, skill um a system where you gain some skill points and you assign them wherever, but you don't actually level. It's a it's a different method. Um, so what I want to talk about was you know how one of my favorite games, you know, an old school um, Renaissance game, has kind of uh, reduced, if not eliminated, the need for leveling. So I'm going to talk about what James Edward Ragey the Fourth has done in Lamentations of the Flame Princess. So some of the things I'm going to talk about are the the actual rules in this original book which I think I got it in 2010 is when I first started playing it. And then some of the additional stuff, uh, his playtest rules he's put in this book, this free RPG day book, and this one that I backed. So, and you know, so I'm going to talk about that and some of the things I've done, some of my experiences, anecdotes, but these are all really pretty much from my experience. Uh, the first thing that he's done, because what, what James has really done here is he's adapted this really familiar rule set, set of mechanics that we all know and love. So we can still use those. It's very familiar. But, once again, he's eliminated this focus on the need to level. So, first thing is the VAM magic system. I'm not going to go into complete detail about how it works. I think I made a video or two about that. And, and if I didn't, you can find other stuff on the Internet. There's lots of stuff written about this. Um, he's removed the idea of the spell level. The spells are what they are. Some are more powerful than others. Uh, you roll randomly to see which ones you get. But you can cast one per caster level safely. So, it's not this big, huge, you know, um, exponential a degree of spells and spell power you get. And there are all sorts of checks, you know, and balances. You can cast more spells than that, but it becomes less safe. And there's a whole series of rules about that. And there's some, some expansions in, in this one in terms of what those rules are. It's not, you know, enormously different. And I've used this system twice now. I've used it in our Lamentations in Prussia game. I've used it in our um, uh, Lamentations of the Martian Princess game, which hopefully we get to play again tonight. And we, we and that one we kind of made a little bit of hybrid system, used some spell points, so it's, it's a little more difficult to cast higher level spells, a little more risky. But, you know, still pretty darn close because um, we've been experimenting with it. But in both these games, you know, Lee, your humble game master, was able to cast Simulacrum and speak with dead, pretty high-level spells. And uh, Eloy was just able to cast Shape Change last week and turn into a dragon and save the party, which is awesome, because these are things that you can't normally do at even, like, mid-level. And so these spells become available, and it's not overpowered because there's, all, there's some checks and balances, and there's some pretty horrible things that can happen. But the idea being that, you know, it, you don't need to wait Till fifth level, till you can cast Fireball. You know, it's it's available to you um, here. So that's pretty cool. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is the saving throw rules that he kind of threw out in this book, as as uh, an idea. And he uses a dice pool system. We've been messing around with something with very similar uh, percentages, uh, with a D20 modifier. And somebody put the, something like that on the web, and I wish I could remember who it was so I could credit them. But we kind of tweaked that even a little bit more, just so we can add some modifiers to it. It doesn't really matter. The idea is your saves are what they are. Um, they're pretty darn good. They're somewhere around, you know, what you would expe expect at like fifth level or, or seventh level, that sort of thing. Um, but they never improve. They're simply your saving throws. And so you don't have to worry about progressing to get better at avoiding the really nasty junk that might, you know, uh, you might encounter in the world. So I really like that. The next thing I want to talk about that he, he's done, which really has helped kind of reduce this need for leveling to finally grow into your character concept, is the skill system that he put in this book. And actually, the original skill system, you know, helps us an awful lot as well. But the idea, you know, uh, I have videos talking about, like, how would you tweak in uh, Lamentations of the Flame Princess skills. I think I have probably like four or five of them. Other people have, you know, spilled a lot of ink and, and hit their keyboards quite a bit talking about the very same thing. And what James has done here is he's given everybody some skill points in the beginning and pretty much what you can do, I mean, he tells you to roll randomly here, but you don't need to roll randomly. Uh, and we, we actually... Uh, switched gears right in the middle of our Lamentations of the Martian Princess game when I reread this book, and you know, so I because I was having them progress very slowly, you know, and we have the one guy that's you know, uh, yeah, uh, Jose's playing a guy that's kind of like a ranger, 
you know, so he already had a kind of a little bit of a bushcraft skill, so he's just, you know, adding little bits and pieces to that. And instead, the idea is, okay, you can have one skill that where you're really, really good at, right out of the gate, and another one where you're really pretty darn good at, uh, like at least 50-50. And so this all of a sudden lets you have this character concept in terms of what are they good at outside of their class, and it's there. That's what they're good at. It's not necessarily going to improve unless they're a specialist, but you don't have to worry about growing into it. It's just there, which is awesome. And then specialists, uh, you know, in, in the original rules, one of the neat things that he's done uh, with these rules is you have these points to spread around and kind of customize your thief, you know, <laughs> if you want to use the old jargon. But the idea is um, that it's not limited. You're not limited to like only one or two points, you know, per level. You can throw everything into stealth if you want to or earn to tinker. And you can make this guy be who you want him to be right from the get-go. And so that's pretty darn cool. Um, so I like that uh, a lot. Um, the next one is attack bonus and armor class. Uh, the, the, you know, a lot of these rules that he's put in here, the first time I read them in the original book and in some of these you know, other books, the first time I was very taken aback. I said, this won't work because this, this, and this. And it's been my experience that's not the case. Um, attack bonus and armor class kind of work hand in hand because one of the things that James... Uh, does this is more of like a game philosophy is don't have this big giant uh, range of armor classes keep things down in the kind of the human level you know armor classes for the most part of the monsters and the weird things that you know are out there in the world shouldn't be above you know what chain mail might uh, provide maybe at the very end of the scale what plate mail might provide but a lot of people run around unarmored it's not that hard to hit a lot of things and the classes except for fighters never increase in their attack bonus. But that's okay because the things, they, they actually have a chance to hit stuff you know, from, you know, first level on. And, you know, fighters are just a little bit better. They're, they're one better in their attack bonuses. One of the things he did in this book to really differentiate fighters from um, non-fighters even more is he uh, split up, you know, the various types of attacks, whether it's, you know, firearms or uh, missile attacks or uh, melee attacks or, you know, a parry of sorts. And the idea that, you know, I may get this wrong a little bit, the idea that, like, non-fighters, they are only plus one at two of those. The rest of those, they are zero, where fighters are plus two at everything. So it even differentiates the fighters a little bit more from the non-fighters. So that, that helps quite a bit. So that, that, once again, reduces this need to level because I need to get better because the monsters are going to get better uh, in terms of their, their armor class. Um, next thing is hit points. And this is one of the places where the game actually does, you know, have a power creep of sorts. But one of the neat things that he's done in this game, once again, is he, he uses this very old method, um, you know, back from the OD and D games, where when you roll your hit dice, you know, every level, you know, you add another hit die, you roll them all. You know, you don't just keep your old hit points; you roll them all. If it's higher than what you had before, then that's those are your new hit points. Um, and what this does really is this is regression to the mean. You know, if you had a bunch of hit points in the beginning because you rolled really high, well, you're not going to get a whole lot extra ones. If you roll really low. Well, it'll help you out. But, you know, if you're rolling a D8, you're going to get an average of four and a half hit points per level. So you're going to have an, um, some uh, degree of uh, uh, increase in ability. Now that I, you know, if I can talk, <laughs> if I can put together a sentence. Uh, but it's not enormous. And if you want to fluff it out, like I like to, um, you know, using the, like the Tim Cask idea, this is your ability to avoid the telling blow. You know, okay, every level you have one more chance, um, statistically, you know. Why didn't this blow really hit you? Why, you know, what, what happened? Maybe your character just gets luckier when they level. You know, a little bit more, a little bit luckier. Um, the last thing, I think it's the last thing, is the threats without stats. And this is, once again, a, a game philosophy. And James talks about in his old uh, Dungeon Master's Guide, or, you know, uh, I forget what he calls it, Referee's Guide, which is only available in PDF right now. Uh, the idea, there, there are some... Um, Creatures, some things, your, your big, weird, whatever they are, cosmic horrors, they shouldn't have stats, because if it has stats, that means you can kill it. And it's very like Call of Cthulhu-esque, the idea. There, there are certain things that, you know, um, you cannot fight. That shouldn't be the answer to everything. And so there are things you need to run away from. And that sounds really kind of weird. What does that really have to do with leveling? But the idea being that, that you're not, there's not a, a way that you can become powerful enough to then go beat this thing. That's not what it's about. It's about surviving that encounter, you know, avoiding that threat, um, perhaps just uncovering that mystery, all those sort of things. That's, that's more of a game philosophy. But I believe it's important. Um, and last but not least, because apparently that wasn't the last thing, because I wrote myself a little uh, cheat sheet here, um, 
was the uh, the XP uh, and leveling progression. And this is more of like how I do it, but also if you look at like, you know, the, the idea of um, your XP coming from cash in his, uh, in his system rather than like um, defeating monsters, although I believe there might be some, I can't remember, it doesn't really matter. You know, I'll tell you what I'm doing. <laughs> you know, I'm giving my guys on this, these online campaigns like 500 XP for every session. Sometimes it's a pair of sessions because it takes a couple sessions to really create a scene, you know, where they, they survived something or what have you. And, you know, uh, ex uh, leveling up is uh, exponential, requires more and more XP, but the XP you're giving them is linear. And actually, if you kind of look at what happens in, in, in Lamentations of the Flame Princess modules or games or whatnot, you're not, in, once again, encountering bigger and bigger and bigger things where you get more and more stuff and defeat bigger and badder monsters and more treasure. The experience you're going to get is going to be about the same every adventure. So what happens initially is you can get to first level or second level and third level that costs you the same amount of XP, but then to get to fourth level, well that costs you as much XP as it took you to get all the way up to third level. When you get to to get to fifth level, it count you know takes you as much XP as it took you to go you know from second, third, and fourth level. So your uh, progression up the levels slows way the heck down, you know. And there's nothing wrong with that because you don't need to level up so fast. So what do you actually get for leveling up in Lamentations of the Flame Princess if you use all these rules at the end of the day? Well, your hit points increase a little bit every level. And once again, you know, to me, if you can fluff that out and say your character gets a little bit luckier, it doesn't mean they get, can get hurt more. It means they have that many more chances to avoid the telling blow that will kill them. Uh, next, thing, next thing that happens is there's one thing about your class that gets a little better. So the wizard, well, he gets one more spell safely that he can cast. He becomes a little bit more proficient at magic. The the warrior, well he gets, you know, an increase of his attack bonus by one. That's it. All the other things you know he would normally have increased, well that's gone. And for the specialist, well he gets a couple more skill points so he can be a little bit better and you can you know that's whatever. And and that's it. So it takes away this need for all these other things to, to go level. And, and there's this very um, slow progression of these characters where they become a little bit better at their original shtick. And I think that's kind of cool, because it it's allows us to concentrate more on these characters. Who are they? What's going on in, in the game? Does, you know, it doesn't um, mean they're super weak. They're definitely competent, more competent than they would be than your standard first-level character uh, right out of the gate. Uh, however, they're never going to become super powerful. But that's not really the vibe of this game in the first place. And I don't necessarily think that it needs to be the vibe of... A, a Dungeons and Dragons game, anyway, you know, at least in my opinion. But so, you know, that to me is, you know, how uh, Lamentations of the Flame Princess has really reduced the need for leveling, and I like it. What about you?